Welcome to My Life, Chassidah Supplied, episode 447. This program is a merit of Baruch bin Yomim ben Menuch Alana, and Miriam Baschaya Sara Altez, Yikusil ben Leir Rachel and Rachel Bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Tadis ben Miriam and Sara Bas Rachel Altez. So, we are in the middle of the month of Ir, the connecting month between Nisan and Sivan, with Nisan being the month when we were redeemed from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. And then the countdown begins of the counting of the Omer through the entire month of Ir, leading to the 50th day of Bishvuas Matan Torah. So it's a unique time of the year and reflects the energy of this time, the work we do as we count and we refine ourselves, Svira from the word counting, but also from the word Sipur, story, as well as from the word Sapir, illuminate, like an Evan Sapir, like a sapphire stone, a transparency of illuminating a higher light. So when we work each day of the 49 days, we are refining another part of our personality, our character, to prepare ourselves to receive the divine mandate, which is at Sinai, the mandate, the blueprint for life, which allows us and gives us the abilities and the guidance how to fulfill our unique mission in this world and realize the purpose of existence itself to transform this material world into a divine garden and home. So that's the period we are in general terms. Specifically, this week, close to the end of the week, will be Pesach Sheni on the 14th of Ir. And we are also in the week of chapter Parshas Emer. So, as has become the custom in my life, because it's applied, let's talk a bit about the time in which we're in. In the words of the Alter Rebbe, just to emphasize the Chassidus applied aspect, someone asked me, Chassidus applied began first day, 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 addressing personal issues, challenges, psychological issues through the lens of Chassidus. But now you're talking lessons from the Parsha, lessons from the time. I said, well, the Alter Rebbe said, you have to live with the time. A big part of our own growth and our healing, and healing doesn't always mean healing from something negative. Healing can mean to grow to a next level, to perfect ourselves, to become more improve, to improve ourselves. One of the ways is we look into the Torah. The Torah is, as the Alter Rebbe said, to live with the times, which means with the Parsha, with the chapter that we read during that time. What does that mean? Because every time has energy. It has unique opportunity. So of course we can talk about there are universal topics that can be addressed any time of the year, but specifically when you look at the Parsha, you look at the holiday or the significant dates that we're experiencing, that's like the channel which gives us even more strength, a window of opportunity, so to speak, that allows us to address issues that are more powerful during that particular time. So it all comes together as a Torah being a blueprint, with, and a Torah, which includes, of course, Chassidus, a blueprint of how to address every issue in our lives. So with that said, let's begin with Pesach Sheni. Then we'll talk about Emer, and then we have Omer, the Svir Emer, and a whole bunch of other interesting topics, which I'm sure you will benefit from as as I have and I do okay so Pesach Sheni what is Pesach Sheni? so the Torah tells us in the chapter Baal Eishcha, it says that there were Jews who could not bring the first Paschal lamb meaning the Pesach when the Jews left Egypt either because they were not pure and you needed to have a certain sanctif- sanctification and in general, or B'derech Recheika, as the Pasuk says, which means they were far away from a place, that refers to in later years, if they're not close to the Beis Amigdash, these offerings have to be brought in the temple. So these Jews that were not able to bring the Pesach, Korban Pesach, I call it Pesach Rishon because of the Pesach Sheni, as you'll see in a minute. So they came to Moshe saying, what do we do? We want to bring this Korban Pesach, which signifies and symbolizes and celebrates the, the leaving of Egypt, and all that is power, the power of the carbon Pesach achieves. Carbon from the word close and Pesach from the word transcendent. Think of a transcendence that brings you closer to the divine. What do you do? 
Well, it's usually the over zmane, over carbone. Over zmane, bottle carbone. Meaning once the time passes, you no longer can do it. Everything is in the time. You can't pray tomorrow if you missed a prayer today. But Moshe turns to Hashem because these Jews cried out, Lomani Goda, why should we be deprived? Why should we be less? And Hashem says, give them the mitzvah of Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni, so if a situation where a person cannot bring the carbon, you have a second chance. And Friedrich Rebbe brings them, it's brought in Hayyem Yem, famous expression, that from Pesach Sheni we learn, Asin Shtokin Farfal. There's no such thing as something is lost, a lost opportunity. So even if a person is bederch hacheka, meaning they are distant, and distant doesn't only mean physically, but also spiritually. Whatever reason, they're not the place where they should be. They've wandered off. Or tmea, they've been taxified, polluted, impure. Again, it can mean many levels. On the technical level, of course, it's referring to the purity of the time of the temple. But in spiritual terms, it refers to every type of impurity that we may have experienced. So you may be, so to speak, at the time, unable to achieve the transcendence of Pesach, the ability to get out of your trappings, out of your constraints, Mitzrayim, your limitations, your fears, your inhibitions, your insecurities. So comes Pesach Sheni and says, no, there's no such thing as Fafal. There's never, it's never lost. You always have a second chance. It's a tremendous lesson in everything in life because we're not perfect human beings. We're flawed and we do make our mistakes. You could think it's a one-way street. Once you pass, the time passes, the clock only moves forward. But you have the ability to correct. You have the ability of second chance. So it's a lesson in hope. It's a lesson in optimism, a lesson in positivity. And as we know, through the negative experiences in our lives, it could actually be propel us to achieve even greater heights. You see here, how did it happen? The Pesach Sheni through them crying out. It was a yearning, a longing from them. That's what evoked this idea because similar to the difference in a tzaddik and a bal tshuva, a tzaddik, so in a righteous person who follows the guidelines and achieves great heights. But a bal tshuva is someone who has wandered off for whatever reason, has been in a distant place, at a sea of oif, in an arid, dry land, but has developed a tremendous thirst, some of the chanafshi. And that thirst says, Loma Negara, why should I be deprived? And that reaches into deeper resources that allows you to reach high, greater heights. A place where Bali Tshuva reach and stand. Sadiqim Gumurim are not even capable of going there. It's a different quality. That's Pesach Sheni. So the question, of course, arises, do we always have a second chance? We see situations where sometimes the damage is done, God forbid, that you can't just turn the clock back. If someone hurts somebody in a way that's irreversible, physically or in other ways. We know certain forms of abuse create deep, deep wounds. So what does it mean there's always a second chance? Is there no such thing as so, as uh, a permanent, uh, a permanent injury. And the answer is no, there isn't. In the physical world, unless there's a miracle, it's true. If God forbid something happens to someone. There are things that can be healed, can be even stronger than they were before. But there are times, situations, certain things don't grow back. But when you talk psychologically, emotionally, and especially spiritually, that's not the case. So physically something may remain a, a physical handicap, but you can develop other strengths. As I mentioned, every negative can bring out deeper strengths. And that is a direct outgrowth, and that means you've reached something. Why is that the case? Because on the spiritual level, there's no such thing as impossible. There's no such thing as lost. It may be difficult, but you're dealing with the divine, with God. And God implanted and embedded into existence this second chance, this idea of Pesach Sheni. 
So we say every morning, The soul you've imbued within me, you've instilled within me, is pure. And then it says, Ata barasa, you created it, you've shaped it, Ata yitzata, Ata nefachta bi, Ata meshamre bekirbi. And you protect it within me. But we know the fact is that people can do things that are not so pure. Tameya, like we just said, impurity, it's the opposite of tahira. And yet we still say every morning, because the soul ultimately is never defiled. It can be concealed. It can be locked up. It can be taken hostage. And it could be a deep wound. But at the end of the day, like we say, I'm asleep, but my heart is awake. The heart is intact. So even if the arteries or the fuel lines and the channels may have been somewhat compromised, but the heart itself always remains intact because we're dealing with a divine soul. Now this is not to dismiss and ignore the pollutants or the toxins or whatever it is that you may have to clean out. But it means that dig deep enough and you'll find the divine essence within it. There's nothing that's pushed away forever. There's always the ability, stuck in farfan, there's always the ability to reclaim and regain. And this includes people who've been hurt very deeply. Without going into details, imagine serious abuse, serious violations of a human being, especially as a child, when a child is defenseless, vulnerable, impressionable. So it could have a very deep impact, a lifetime impact. However, the soul precedes every scar, every wound. And if you dig deep enough, you can reach a place where the wound did not reach. And as such, we always have stuck in for foul. Nothing, not the social thing is lost. Sometimes it requires serious work, sometimes less work. But it gives us a perspective that you always remain intact. And whatever happens to you, happens to you does not define you. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets to our head and psychologically we think it has defined us. And that's where the trouble becomes. Because then the problem is not contained. Once you think that you're really weak, meaning that you don't have hope, then it becomes more difficult because we need you to have confidence in yourself. So this expression, Shtokin for Falun, is a tremendous lesson that you need to know you could heal. And that's the first step toward healing. That doesn't mean it's, not gonna, it's gonna be easy all time, at all times. But that's the problem, that we start identifying with it and then saying, no, it's not possible. That's not up to us. What happened, happened, and we recognize that, and we have to address it. But you don't wanna become weakened by it to the point where you say, I can't do anything about it or shame, or pride, or other factors come into play where you don't want to address it. Now you could be in a weakened state, but it doesn't make you a weak person because neshama shenesata bi tahedihi. So that's one of the tremendous lessons from Pesach Sheni of this week. And it's interesting because it comes in the month of the year, one month after Pesach, because Pesach was exactly that idea. It was the idea of getting out of all our limitations and constraint with Mitzrayim. But interesting, it doesn't stop there. Because even when you get out of that, you may still have people, individuals, who didn't go, leave completely or still have some trace or something that remains from the Mitzrayim, from the clip of Mitzrayim, from the negative energy. In Tameya, Tameya or Recheka, a pollutant or a toxin or Recheka, they're not there, they're not aligned. So comes Pesach Sheni and tells us, no, stuck in Fafal, nothing is lost. You can always achieve that level and even higher levels. <clears throat> so with that, let's talk a bit about Pashas Emir. So first, a small introduction. Someone wrote the question. May as well address it right here. Teira. People ask, what is Teira? Some people say Teira is a book of laws. 
Some say it's a book of stories. It's a book of our history. Teda, the word Teda itself means Heira, directive. It's a guidebook. It's God's, it's life's operator's manual given to us by God who created life as a blueprint for life. And blueprint is not my word, it's from the Medrash. Now when an architect builds a building, first he has a blueprint. So it says, What's the redundancy? We know the Torah is so precise. God said there will be light, and there was light. You could just say, God created light. God read in his blueprint. It says, because he had already prepared a blueprint called the Torah. And that's why the Zaira says, Staka Baraisa Bara Alma. God looked into the Torah and created the world. Similar to what the Medr says right at the beginning of Bresh Yisraba, that the Torah is like the Pinkasoyis, the Pasroyis of Pinkasoyis, like the blueprint. Kach Bana, same thing. When a person looks into the Torah, Vikayim Alma, we preserve the world. We know how to fulfill the purpose of the world. We align the world with God's purpose. So someone asks, is the Torah basically just an instruction manual for how to live and operate in the physical world? Well, I wouldn't call the word just. Absolutely. It's an instruction manual. It's obviously far more than that. We know Torah is rooted all the way is God's innermost delights. But then the Torah traveled downward. God gave us the gift called the Torah. At Matan Torah, Matan as a gift, Matana. And gave it to us to help us direct and guide us. Like a light, Torah Eir illuminates. Like a blueprint, each aspect of this world to understand what its purpose is and how to align it to God's intentions. So on the root, the Torah is far higher than the world. The Torah precedes existence. Like a blueprint precedes the building that is built according to it. But then... It also serves the purpose of aligning existence all the way up to the highest levels of Shashrim Lefon of the Torah as it is in its source. We'll soon talk about who implements that. That's the Neshamas. So it's like a triad, a triangle. Hashem, God, the creator, the blueprint, and then the implementer of that blueprint. Which is the Jewish people who receive the Torah and by extension to the entire world, to all human beings. As far as having stories, as Zaire says, God forbid to say that Tate is a storybook. As far as history, yes, it tells us our history, it tells us the events that happened. But above all, Tate from the word Heira, directive to us. So you have two extremes. It's, God, it's a reflection of God's mind and God's will. As we say, And it's not just something on that sublime level, but it comes down, as the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, and becomes a blueprint that for us to follow, as I said, to fulfill God's essential purpose of an existence. So with that, what personal message does this Pasha offer us, Pasha Semer? So Emmet has a number of, cha- of, uh, of, of lessons. We'll just take one right in the beginning. It says, Emmer Marta. Basically commanding, this is part of Sefer Vayikra, so a lot of it is what's called Teres Kayanim. A lot of it is connected to the less the directives and the obligations of the priests. So it's talking about Ember Amato Lahem to the Kayanim. So Rashi says, Lahazir Malaktanim. Which literally means that the older ones, it's a form of education, Lahazir should warn, should protect, should. Hazir sometimes means like from the word Hazara, to be careful, to take care that the adults should teach the children what they should be careful of, the children that are the priests. But lahazir has another meaning, also from the word zayhar, interestingly. Zayhar means to illuminate, it means splendor, light. Which teaches us that education is not just about instructing what to do, what not to do, to be careful, but also to illuminate. It's a very different take when you tell a child, don't do something because it's dangerous. Yes, that's important because they have to know that it's dangerous. You can't put your finger inside of an electric outlet. Don't walk across the street on your own. Or on deeper levels, behave in a healthy way as fitting to a client. 
and don't do something that will defile yourself. But when you do it in the form of lahazir, with a certain element of love that illuminates and explains, why am I telling you this? Because you're such a beautiful soul. And a beautiful soul has to be clean, has to be pure, has to be healthy. It takes on a whole different dimension. So much of education is often fear-based. Deterrence, because of punishment. Warning, we're warning you. Lahazir is from the word warning. So the Tate is telling us Lahazir also from the word illuminate. Which, even when you warn, can also be done in an illuminating way. Always with a positive touch, with a positive emphasis. What is the goal here? Now this lesson is not just for the technical kahanim. It says, The Jewish people in general are compared to a kingdom of priests. Because a priest essentially is a servant. Someone who serves the divine purpose. So there are kahanim, actual kahanim from Shevet Levi, who are designated to serve in the temple. But all of us have a certain element of kahanim, especially today, when there is no physical temple. So kahanim have their role. But everyone has an element, like the Rambam writes at the end of Hilchah Shemitah V'yevel, the Mishnah Teda, which now we began a new cycle learning the Rambam. He writes, Lei Shevet Levi Belvad, not just the, the, the tribe of Levi alone, but kol ish v'ish meboi elam, every human being on earth. When they separate themselves and refrain and restrain and refrain themselves from getting immersed in the pettiness of materialism. So every person has a miskadish kedish kedashim, sanctifies himself for the holy of holies and brings the verses about Levi and about Levim and Kahanim. Each of us has that ability. So the lessons of Emer, Lahazir, is a lesson to all of us in how to educate, how to communicate, how to inspire, to illuminate the adults illuminating the Kahanim. And that also includes the inner child. That when you speak to yourself, like the Friedrich Rebbe brings, but Ashab, that just like a person has to know their own faults, they have to also know their own qualities. And a person shouldn't speak Lash Nahara on themselves. So even when you're reprimanding yourself for whatever reason, always have the element of Lahazir, the positive side to it. Not to minimize that which needs to be corrected, but just to add a dimension, as we spoke before, that we are not defined by our mistakes. We're defined by our pure soul. And that's something that's illuminating. So even though there's a mistake, that's actually more motivation. That you know there's something pure here and has been somewhat defiled or polluted. It's even more incentive to clean it up, to get back to your natural place, to the power, to the health, to the beauty that shines forth from you to glow and illuminate once again in the best possible way. Okay. So, next question. So, we have also in this week's parsha a story, controversial story of Shlomit, the son of Shlomit, I should say, a woman who was um, impregnated by an Egyptian. And the the Torah tells us the story about this person without even mentioning his name. So even though the woman came from the Shevet Don, but since a Shevet, the tribe goes by the father, and his father was Egyptian, so Don rejected him. Then he ended up blasphemizing God, and for that he was put to death. So it's a very controversial story. I've already addressed it, as I'll discuss in a moment. So someone writes, Dear Rabbi Jacobs, Every year when we read Pasha Semer, I get angry at the injustice of the story of the son of Shlomit, a Jewish woman who was captured by an Egyptian man and impregnated. Because the laws of land and property ownership were divided in a patrilineal way, since this man's father was not Jewish, he couldn't claim tribal lineage. So the tribe he was living with kicked him out. He went down the road and asked a different tribe to please let him stay. And they refused, and he became homeless. His response was to curse them and then to curse Moshe Rabbeinu and Hashem. His actions were reported to Moshe Rabbeinu, who judged that he should be put to death. I always found the story unfair because according to Torah law, since his mother was Jewish, he's 100% Jewish and did nothing wrong to be mistreated this way. 
He deserved to have a home just like everyone else. But this year I'm looking at the, very, at the story differently. And I'm seeing the story as the Torah teaching us a big lesson to how to deal with adversity. We are always going to have challenges in our lives and sometimes there will be injustices. But it's important to deal with these situations in the proper way. The man chose the wrong way to respond by getting angry and cursing Hashem. Perhaps if he had just gone over to Moshe Rabbeinu nicely and explained the situation, then Moshe would have found the solution for him and he would have had a home. What are your thoughts? So interesting that you come to that lesson. Definitely an excellent lesson, but I think we still have to explain the actual story. I mean, was it, to just blame it all on him because he uh, was kicked out by others, there must be more going on. So indeed, in episode 401, I actually elaborated on this. Just briefly, there I was a long discussion about, in general, when you see an injustice or something in the Torah that seems out of character, out of spirit, we need to know the Torah is God's Torah. And it's a Torah's chesed, a Torah of love. The whole Torah was given to bring peace to this world. So if you see an episode like this, you have to know there's more going on. It's like when you know someone that is a loving person and everything they do is always from, with profound love and then you see them do something or someone tells you they did something that seems out of character, you say to yourself, I know this person. So there must be something going on here. Now this doesn't mean people can't make mistakes, but, but generally you try to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Now if you thought it was a person that's a cruel person and then it's not a surprise that he behaved in a cruel way. So when you read a story like this where the tater is so underscores the foundation of all the Tehidah is Av, of Ahavtarecha Kamaycha. Klal Godl B'Tehidah and Hillel said, that's the entire Tehidah, everything else is commentary. And the whole Tehidah is saturated with chesed and kindness. You see a story like this, but suddenly the tribes, what happened to the kindness? We're taught that we're kind to a stranger. We're kind to people even if they, do a tra- even if they transgress. So you have to say, and when you start looking in the inner story, remember the written Torah is written very briefly. You look in the Madrashim, Tehidah B'Pirushan Yitna, interpretations, explanations, you do find out. Being that his father was Egyptian, it wasn't just that he was an Egyptian. Shlamit was definitely a victim. But because of the Egyptian, like the Erev Rav, they actually influenced. So this son, and interesting that Torah doesn't even mention him by name, this son was a troublemaker. Part of like the Erev Rav. And he was affecting others. Long before this story. So it wasn't the tribe just rejected him. He was, he was a real problem. His blasphemizing, yes, had he not, had he gone to Moshe kindly and nicely, perhaps they could have resolved it a certain way, but it didn't come from nowhere. It came from a problem here. Now, why did no one take care of this child properly? That's a good question. But the Torah is telling us about a situation where a person is, you bring someone into your home that can literally be, be destructive and destructive in real ways to hurt other children, to hurt others. You still have to take care of everyone. We don't reject anyone. But the tribes were behaving basically because they saw who we're dealing with here. And then, of course, it was exposed and how he started blasphemizing. It's like a person who's behaving. Like, think of a, I don't want to compare him to a Nazi because I don't know if he was a Nazi. He was the son of an Egyptian who was a very cruel Egyptian. But imagine a Nazi suddenly comes and says, I'd like to come move in, and you know who he is. And he's behaving nicely, at least for now. Then you suddenly realize when you reject him, he starts cursing. Oh, you realize who he really is. So the Torah, you have to take into account that whole bigger picture. Now, it's interesting. On the other hand, there's also the lesson that even when something may seem unjust, you know, we know the expression in the Geras the Alter Rebbe says, that when someone does something to you, even if it's a real injustice, you have to know the person who was hurt, it was already decreed in above that that should be the case. The person who did the, da- the wrong thing will be accountable on his bad choice. But there are lessons that to be learned also from the receiving end, that even when things seem un- unjust, the approach has to be not to become angry and not to reciprocate and to fuel fire with fire, but to take a more, a, a more gentler approach. So I appreciate your lesson as well. I think it's also another lesson. Like we said, Torah is lessons. 
and teaches us how to deal with challenges. So there are many lessons that can be learned here, including us looking for children that may have been hurt or may have been maybe even destructive, not to completely reject them, know how to deal with them. And perhaps Don was not the ones that knew how to deal with it. Maybe Moshe should have dealt with it. So that needs to be looked at more. Why couldn't they deal? Or maybe he was at a point where it was like, I don't want to say Farfaun, because we just said Pesach Shein is stuck in Farfaun. But again, you're dealing here with bad blood. You're dealing with someone who had destructive intentions and would have caused even more problems. And that's the only reason the Torah would any, ever say that somebody should be put to death, is because they can create death. It's not just because they blasphemize and God cares whether you curse them or not. You're talking about a person who's carrying death in him, like a murderer. And remember, there was that concept. The blasphemy was not always just the words. It reflected on a person's entire attitude, which was to defy God and defy life itself and the value of life. That's what we were dealing with here. Okay, in episode 401, I discussed it as well. So if you want more on this, go, please go there. As I mentioned, we're also in the days of Omer, the Sefirah Sa'emer. The Sefirah Sa'emer is a countdown, as I mentioned as well. The Ran, the end of Psachim, says that when the Jews were preparing for Mount Teir, they were counting in anticipation. When you look forward to something, you count down day by day by day. But we also know that it's a form of refinement. That's why in every day of Sefirah you see Chesed Sheba Chesed, Gvurah Sheba Chesed. So someone asked the question, um, the question is this, in these weeks of the Omer, how can we access the corresponding sphere and draw down its flow into our lives? But just a short introduction, what are the spheres? The spheres in general, I mentioned, have three meanings. Sphere from the word count, from the word sipur, story, narrative, and from the word sapir, sapphire stone, illuminating, transparency. In Ayim Bays, in volume one, talks at length about the spheres, these three meanings, and gives then a fourth meaning from the word sefer, like a sefer, the, a, a book, which is even higher than illumination, reflecting God's book itself. What does it mean in our personal lives? And that's why we say chesed shebe chesed, gvur shebe chesed, like we say in the Hirotzen. We, the human being, and our soul is made up of ten faculties. As the Alter Rebbe explains in chapter 3 in Tanya, the ten faculties in the Shtal Shlomhem evolve from the ten spheres. So there are three intellectual ones, Chachma bin Adas, and seven emotional ones. Chesed, Gura, Teferes, Netzach, Hayid, Yisrael, Malchus. Here the focus, the same is on the seven times seven, 49. Because each one has all the others within it, the interconnectivity. So each day of the sphere, what we're doing is refining the personality, the character feature of Chesed, the week of, first week is the week of Chesed, the week of Gvur. And each of them indeed, they are channels of divine energy, channels of the divine spheres that, that in turn become embedded within our faculties. And when you use your Chesed the right way, and then the Gvur Sheba Chesed the right way, the Fer Sheba Chesed, you in turn are aligning yourself, just like a person who exercises physically, becomes healthier, they align themselves and the energy flows better. So the divine energy flows into us in a much more seamless way, getting rid of the pollutants, getting rid of the negative stuff, the tumma, as we say in the Hidratzen, the impurities, which is essentially the dysfunctional behavior and the unhealthy behavior, and in turn, creating healthy channels. And each week we focus Years ago, I wrote a book called The Spiritual Guide to Counting the Umr to actually spell out what exactly is the work for each week and each day. And God has been quite popular. Today there's an app, My Omer. You can still access it, even though we're in the middle of the Counting the Omer. You can access it. It's a free app, both on Android and on iOS, on, uh, on uh, iPhones, as well as receive every day a uh, reminder, if you like, in the email, by email. And of course, the book itself. And that includes exercises to each day, a meditation, a contemplation on the energy of that day, or you can say the character, personality feature of that day. And with exercises of what you can do to enhance and improve that part of you. And you'll see some areas we're strong in, some areas need more strength, some areas we're weak in, we need to embolden, we need to, we need to harness it. 
So in the week of Tiferes, the question is, which was last week, it's toward the Chassidus that Tiferes of Atzil says Midas Harachem, which is the Midda, the attribute of compassion. So how can we access that sphere and correct the blockage or open its flow wider if we need to open the gates of mercy to resolve problems? So if you look in this book, it'll tell you day by day, there's Tiferes, there's Chesed Shebet Tiferes, the kindness within compassion, the discipline within compassion, the compassion within compassion, and so on. But briefly, it's midah keneg and mida, which means commensurate. When we behave in a compassionate way, it opens up channels of compassion. When we hope and behave in a chesed, a kind way, it opens up channels of kindness. Kemayim aponim laponim. Just like kein leva adam la adam. Just as a face is reflected in water, one heart is reflected in another. And the same thing with leva adam elyon. That when we behave with our heart in a compassionate way, the heart of above from God, from the divine compassion of Atsilas, flows downward through Biriya, Yitzir Asiya, from At and through Neshama Shanasata Bitahiri, all the way into Nafakta Bivata Meshamri Bikirbi within each one of us. That's the basic answer. The breakdown, I suggest going to the places I referred to earlier to see the seven within Teferis. This week we're in the week of Netzach. Netzach is determination, drive, ambition, persistence. The word Netzach comes from the word victory. We all need that midah, which is not to be timid, but to be persistent, to be determined. But that too needs to be analyzed and evaluated. Sometimes determination, it also needs his breaks, you need to have restraint. That's the hoid within Netzach. The same thing, chesed within Netzach, the Gvura within Netzach, again, the breakdown is in general. What does it mean in general? It's the determination, of obviously for good things. So when you have Netzach below, it draws down Netzach from above. You learn Basil Lagani, Friedrich Rebbe's last mimer delivered, the last mimer published, Yud Shvat Tov Shin Yud, and the Rebbe's explanation in each corresponding chapter, so especially in chapter 10 and on, 11 and on, we start speaking about Netzach, Midas HaNetzachen. Midas HaNetzachen is that need to be victorious over enemies. In this case, God, over all the negative things that are antithetical to the divine. And who fights that battle? The Anshe Chayel, the simple foot soldiers. So when they are determined in their work, explained also beautifully in a Maimer, Pesach Mamarim of Tav Tess of the Friedrich Rebbe, that determination draws down Netzach Yisrael HaYashakim that draws down the Midas HaNetzachim from the highest levels as it says the Oitzis the treasures that have been always hidden so God the King splurges and gives out those treasures specifically to win that battle so determination is a critical piece and that is the energy of this week and the same will continue in the next week, Hoid, and then Yisoyed and Malchus. Okay, since we're talking about the soul and its faculties, so it's a good opportunity to continue where we left off last week. I was speaking about what is a soul. And briefly, I put it in simple English because it could be sometimes somewhat too academic or abstract. So obviously a soul is the energy within us. Take a soul, with a body without a soul, it doesn't have, it's like, a, it's like a, think of an appliance without electricity, a light bulb without electricity. It, it just, will just be inanimate. So the soul definitely energizes. But there's much more to a soul than just energy. It's not just electricity. There's nefesh, ruach, neshama, chai, yechida, we know. So ultimately, what is a soul? A soul is the divine purpose within you. So with the soul giving energy and all the other factors, ruach being the emotional part of the emotional faculties of the soul, like we speak the seven midas. Neshama is the intellectual faculties. Chai is the transcendent element. Yechid is that oneness, which it originates. Oneness with what? With yachid. That God, the creator, embedded his instructions, his DNA into our soul. That's why a soul is... We'll soon talk about a Jewish soul, but that's why a soul is essentially a divine instruction. Think of a, mu- a composer 
creating musical notes. The musical notes are just expressions of the composer wanting to sing his song. So each human being as a soul is God's song within us, God's intention and purpose. Same example you can give with an author in a book. So the words are the body, the message, the spirit of the words, that's the soul. And that soul then travels through the faculties. Remember, the faculties are instruments of the soul. And then the garments of the soul, as he explains in Tanya, are the expressions of the soul, thought, speech, and action. So in following up, a few questions regarding the soul, and then we'll talk about what is a Jewish soul. Okay, I'm just reading exactly as it was written. Uh, recently, we've been getting a lot more questions, I should mention, because of uh, our, I guess, uh, skyrocketing YouTube channel, which really has grown completely beyond imagination. So I'm letting many people sending in questions, and some of them end up here on my, on my desk. So a person writes, Hey man, I love your content. You really bring a lot of meaning to an otherwise non-spiritual life. I just want to get some concepts right. Right now I see the soul as the interpretation each agent gives to the information received. Information is a whole, but we divide it in parts to give these parts meaning. So each object we see has a soul as well as each human. But this is only the interpreted, the interpreted soul. True, the true soul is only witnessed by God. But right here I see a lot of mention going on about the soul going to heaven or reincarnated. What do you mean by this? Is it the experience that you're talking about or is it the unconscious part or is it the ego, the role we played in life or all of it? We can't seem, I can't seem to get a functioning world model out of this. I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to, but briefly, as I said, um, if you think of the soul as God's intention for you, sends you on a mission, the soul carries that mission. The mission is to enter into your body into your family, into the world, into the corner of the world where you live, with all the different opportunities and interactions you're going to have in order to express that soul, to express God's purpose in you and everything around you, which is essentially to refine and spiritualize the material world, the corner of the material world in which, which you occupy. Each person on earth has a soul to fulfill that purpose. Now, the soul itself, as I said, manifests and, get, and is given a bunch of instruments, a mind, emotions, ways to implement, to execute thought, speech, and action. But also, there's part of the soul, as this person refers to, what we call the superconscious, the things we're not conscious of, called chay and yechid, the two higher levels of the soul, are things we're not conscious of. But they're very much part of who we are. They're the fundamental essence of who we are. So the, the journey of awareness of your soul is a whole life journey. How deep? Some people are only aware of our biological side, the fact that we are alive. I mentioned before, like the electricity, so to speak. Then we realize there's more to life than that. There's the emotional part of our lives. There's the intellectual part of our lives, the cognitive. Then there's the transcendent, the superconscious, and then the super supra. You go all the way to the root. It's the singular mission for which you were given the singular mission you were given is embedded in that soul. So essentially it's the DNA that you have is God's instructions. But you need to discover it and then implement it. So I hope that helps understand. Going to heaven or reincarnation are all part of the Joel's journey. That when a soul finishes its work in this world, if it didn't fit, complete it, it will return to finish the job into a different body. The concept of reincarnation, which I've talked about in other and other programs. The kind of going to heaven, it's not about heaven in the sky, it means go back, it's, it leaves the body like electricity leaves the appliance, and it goes. the soul goes back to its natural spiritual place. And in heaven, they say reward in heaven means the soul continues its journey, benefiting from all that it's achieved. All the good things the soul does now returns by feeding and nourishing the soul with more spiritual energy, with more divine experiences. And then, of course, there's the other side, which I'm not going to address here, what happens if a soul didn't do what was right in this world. How do you cleanse that? But ultimately, in the Shamish and the Satabi Tahiri, as I said before, is pure. So I hope that helps understand that a bit. 
Dear Meaningful Life Center, I'm writing this message because I want to understand what we can do if we were previously able to communicate with a close one's soul, but we're no longer able to see it, nor communicate or connect with it. I'll give a brief explanation of the situation below. In one of Rabbi Simon's, Simon's YouTube videos about what is a soul, it was mentioned that we must look for the soul of a person, and we must look for their deeper purpose, intention, or song, and we mustn't focus our attention on what they do. So what I mean by that is that to do is a, rea- is a reflection of who they are. To really understand somebody, you want to see their soul. I have a close friend who's became really closed off. I feel like I had eyes on their soul at one point, but now I feel like they're only their body. The friend doesn't show curiosity like a soul should. As the example given in the video, my friend is full of gab. He has all the channels to communicate, meaning a large social circle, but I feel disconnectedness wherever, whenever I'm around him. And he never communicates about feelings from within or feelings of awe. I have a suspicion he might be depressed on the inside, but he tries to hide it from everyone by saying it's all good and that he's happy and satisfied. What can I do if I can no longer connect with that person, their intention and their soul? What can I do if I want to help them? Very good question. We all face sometimes this dilemma. Um, I would also add to the question ourselves, what happens if you can't connect to your own soul? Sometimes we get so caught up in the minutia of life the pettiness even, things that offended us, things that hurt us. And it's hard to access that inner strength that you really is your, your birthright. So there are things you need to do. Just like if your body feels weak, you need to have a good diet, good rest, exercise, hygiene, and other behaviors. Make sure that your body is being, if being nourished properly. Same thing your soul needs to be nourished. The soul can't be strong if it's not nourished. So I often talk about immersing the soul in your spiritual spa. Spa, an acronym for study, prayer, action. The cognitive study, cognitive conditioning, prayer is emotional conditioning, and action is behavioral conditioning. That every day, study something spiritual. Emote, say a prayer, a feeling, a song, a poem, that's spiritual. And do something, do an act of kindness, help somebody, deliberately. That, immerses, that feeds your soul, immerses your soul in a spa, which in turn nourishes it and allows it to express itself. And when you're more soulful, like I said, kemayim upon the upon him, just as a face is reflected in water, so too a heart's reflected in another, your heart and your soul will then impact the other. Is it guaranteed? It's not guaranteed, but the more soulful you are and the more you speak, words from the heart enter the heart then it's more likely that the person may respond. You do your best. It doesn't always work. People have their top moments, they have their moods, they have their blocks. But if you really care about this person, you try and you don't give up. Now, not every battle you have to fight and not every battle you have to win, but you have to try. You can offer them to read something, you can invite them over, you can come see them. And even if they're right now still in a superficial mode, whatever that person is afraid of, like you said, maybe it's depression, you always show kindness You always show love. You always show I'm there. Obviously, you have to make sure that you don't get hurt in the process. Some people get so invested in another person and that they can get hurt in the process. You have to have your boundaries. Even if it's someone you care about a lot, you love. I don't know the details, whether it's a relative, whether it's somebody close or just a friend. When I say just a friend, I mean a friend more casual. But that's the general approach, and that's part of the whole experience. And never, never underestimate the kindness you show is also soulful. Remember, souls are kind. They have kindness, which brings me to the next question. What are the ten powers of the soul, and how can we use them in our daily lives to grow and become better people? The ten powers I mentioned before are the ten faculties. Three cognitive, chachma bin adas, a concept, elaborating on it. And das is the conclusion, the, the resonance of it. Then it comes into emotions, which is love, chesed, gvura, discipline, teferis, compassion, netzach, yisayid, malchus, respectively, ambition or determination, humility, acknowledgement, yielding, yisayid, foundation, bonding, and malchus, dignity. As I said, I expelled it out more in the book, Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer. 
Those are the ten faculties. And that's how we express our soul. That's how we nourish our soul, by using those faculties for soulful purposes and not for things that are superficial or nonsense. And by also then reaching out to others with these faculties and expressing those faculties as you interact with someone else's chabad, chagas, and him, someone else's cognitive, emotional, and behavioral um, faculties. Okay. With that, let us move to the next part of this discussion, which is, now that we know what a soul is, the question is, what is a Jewish soul? What is a Jewish soul? As I posed last week, to break it down even further, so we spoke about the first verses, the first time a soul is described is in the Bible, right in the beginning, right in Bereshis. On the sixth day of creation, God said, Nasa Adam will create a human being, in our image and likeness, and created the human being, male and female, in the divine image, then God separated man, man and woman, male and female, and indeed, that is why they seek out for each other to reunite what we call soulmates, to reconnect to the divine image that both of them complement each other in achieving. As I said, what, is, what did God do? He took a clump of earth, shaped it into a body, and then vayipach ba'apav, ata nefachtabi, vayipach. He breathed into it. Vayipach from the word nefich, he blew into it with intensity. When you breathe very deeply into something, you know, you blow like, you're, like, like blowing up a balloon, so to speak. So you need to bring from Metechi Yusei, Ume Pnimi Yusei, Man de Nafach, Metechi Nafach, as the Alter Rebbe brings chapter 2 in Tanya, that when you blow it comes from within, much more than just words. When you speak, there's also a breath. But it's not that intense breath coming from the deepest in, insides of you. What does that reflect? That God is investing in this soul, his deepest insights, his deepest purpose for existence. So all other creations of the world and the whole existence is like the platform. That's the stage. The table is now set. Comes the human being carrying within his DNA the purpose of his existence. To refine this world, that's the soul. Adam and Eve, they had children, who in turn have children, and we are all their descendants. So we all have the common ancestor, our common ancestors, Adam and Eve. Now this is long before we even have the concept of a Jew or non-Jew. The concept of a Jew technically begins at Mount Sinai, 20 to 26 generations later. 2,448 years since from the time of Adam, to be exact. Abraham is sometimes called the first Jew because he embraced what would ultimately become formal Judaism. And we'll talk about that momentarily. So Adam and Eve are really the ancestors of the entire human race, and there weren't yet distinctions. They were divine creatures, and indeed, every human being is a divine creature. That's why we say, Chaviv Adam, the Mishnah says, how precious is the human being, Shaniv B'Tzalem, that was created in the divine image. Then it says, Chaviv Yisrael, that Israel, the Jewish people, have a special quality. The children, the children, and they receive the Torah. But you see, this is there. So indeed, in contrast to what many people misunderstand, Every human being on this earth, now there are 8 billion people, I believe, is created in the divine image, all originating from Adam and Eve. So then what makes a Jew unique? And why is the Alter Rebbe saying, Tanya, nefesh Hashem is Yisrael? That in Israel there's a second soul, and that's a chelik chelik hamamash, and it brings these verses that I'm describing. These verses talk about all people. So briefly... Let's make one thing very clear. No one is here in this world by accident. Every person was chosen by God. So when you say the Jews are the chosen people, it needs explanation. What does it mean chosen? And what were non-Jews chosen? They were also chosen. No one came by accident. So the difference is for what they were chosen, what purpose. So what happened after Adam and Eve, we know, they ate from the tree of knowledge. And then the subsequent generations continued to transgress and wander away from their purpose from their neshama, from their soul, which they were imbued with. They became more materialistic, more pagan. It's Abraham that began reversing the process. And he was 20 generations after Adam and Eve. He began reversing the process. And as a result, 
began to bring the divine back into his soul and into the world around him. That would go on for several generations until the seventh generation where Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, took the, led the Jews out of Egypt, they went to Mount Torah, and then they became a Jewish nation. As a matter of fact, all conversion originates from the events of Mount Torah. They had to convert. They went to, into a mikvah, immersed themselves in a ritual bath, they accepted the mitzvahs, which was the Torah of the mitzvahs, and they also circumcised themselves after they left Egypt. And that's where the laws of conversion, because technically there was no such thing as a halacha Jew until that point, because the laws were not given for that. But you could say if the philosophical Jew, what does that mean? The way Adam and Eve were meant to be, had they not eaten from the tree of knowledge, the whole world I wouldn't say it would, would have been Jewish, so to speak. What does it mean Jewish means? It means completely saturated with divine awareness. Now what about the other nations of the world? They too have that obligation to come to discover God. And they too, many, also children of Abraham. Abraham had a son called Isaac, but he also had a son, Yishmael. Isaac had a son called Jacob, but he also had a son, Esau, who became the father and the ancestor, you can say, of the Western Roman Christian world, Yishmael being the ancestor of the Arab Muslim world. And even the other nations of the world, even other be attributed perhaps to the other children of Abraham that he had later and send them to the east. But regardless how you understand that, the idea, the principle that Adam and Eve were created was for every human being. What happened was that Abraham defied and did not conform to the pagan ways of the nations around him and he reintroduced God and that introduced the concept of what a Jew would be. Reminding the world of God but the obligation is that every person on earth should know that because that's what each one of our souls is. So if you say the Jews as the chosen people, you'd say their soul is unique in the sense. They're like we call, some people call them the people of the book. People who are the witnesses, the carriers. So in a sense, they are fully aware or should be fully aware of that DNA, of that divine element, the chelik alikam and mal mamish, that they have unique to them. The nations of the world also have a divine spark, a divine soul within them. But it's different. And the distinction is essentially what roles they play in bringing the divine into existence. In the language of Chassidus, the nations of the world transform the world to make it a divine home, a civilized place. The Shevis Yitzhara. The Jewish soul has the unique capacity to bring in a higher level of the divine now, this doesn't mean that a non-Jew cannot do that and that a Jew should not also be involved in transforming the world. It just means, generally speaking, you have this as the mission. This is the chosen part. And it came by choice. Abraham chose to be that way. And he taught it to his children. Others rejected it. And that's why, indeed, by Sinai, what does it say? That God came to all the nations of the world and offered them the Torah. Why? Because they were all meant from the time of Adam and Eve to be Man, fulfilling God's mandate. And now the time has come, but they were not ready. They were not ready, and that's why they looked into the Torah and they said, it's not for us, we're not ready to accept different laws, whether the laws against war and murder, or the laws against theft, or whatever it may be. But God did offer it to them because he was preparing them because he knew they deserved it. They should be part of it. As the generations pass, they would ultimately embrace it, and especially when Mashiach comes, they will all embrace it. But it was one nation, one nation, a minority, a minority that did choose to embrace and live up to the Torah no matter how difficult it would be and how the world would oppose it. Look at what Haman says to Achashverosh when he incites and wants to create, cause genocide, perpetrate genocide against all the men, women, children, the Jewish. He says, Yeshna am echad, amim. There's this one nation that's among us, spread out among us, but they say I'm Shainus Makalam, but their religion, their faith is different than all of us. Almost echoing what Hitler said. This fear, the Jew, the stranger, the, the, the alien that they felt. But this alien was bringing an alien idea, which is what? In a pagan materialistic world to know that there's a God, and that's threatening. 
Mordechai would not bow to Haman. That's what made him unique. He wouldn't bow to Haman. Because a Jew, Yehudi, means that he serves and acknowledges only God and denies anything pagan, anything man-made. I will not worship a human being. This was infuriating. Pare also wanted to be worshipped. He himself felt himself as a god. So that's what the Jew represented, that there is one God and not man-made things. The non-Jewish world for many years represented the other approach. That has obviously changed, thank God, over the years. So Adam and Eve were created to recognize God and they had that God within them. Every person on this earth has that. The question is, who led the way? Abraham led the way. That's clear. Everyone acknowledges that. The pioneer taught it to his children. His children continued. Then they received the mandate. The nations of the world have their purpose and it always remains there. And in that sense, there's that difference. So if you think about it, it's not the way most people think of it. It's not racial. It's not genetic. It's not based on, uh, on uh, cultural things. It's based on divine purpose. There are those that carry that divine purpose within that element, and that's what makes a Jewish soul unique in that sense. But again, this doesn't mean that a non-Jewish person cannot have that experience, but it all comes down to, firstly, historically, how it came about, and also the levels. And each one has their role, just like within Jews, there's Kohanim, Levim, Yis- and Yisraelim. Yisraelim. There are priests and there are Levites and Israelites. An Israelite cannot go into the Holy of Holies, cannot go into the temple. So you could say that, the, that he's, he's, he's not chosen to go into the temple. Correct. He's chosen to fulfill his purpose outside of the temple. That's also part of the divine purpose. And when you take ego out of the way, and our job with Bittl is just to fulfill our purpose, everyone has their purpose. The nations of the world are the, are the majority. Their purpose is transforming this material world into a civilized environment, as we've seen happen, especially in the last hundreds of years. Not bar- barbarism, not tyranny, tyranny, and not other forms of uh, totalitarian regimes that oppress, but to offer human rights, to respect that all people are created equal, and we all have freedoms, exactly as we see that has happened in the last few centuries. So that purpose is a tremendous purpose because that helps transform the world. And then there's the purpose that the Jews add, not, they also have that purpose, add and introduce a dimension that Abraham introduced, something perhaps a nonconformist approach, something that really defies, not just that transforms the world, but brings a whole new energy that's beyond existence altogether, transcendence into reality. If you want more on this, Interesting, this I would refer you to Lukut Sikh is volume 13, page 230, the footnotes there at length, as well as a Sikh in volume 15 in Lukut Sikh is Noyach, talks about keeping Shabbos, the laws about keeping Shabbos, a Jew, non Jew, and the distinction between the two in this context. There's much more to be said, but due to time limits, we're going to stop here. And uh, Wish you all a very continuing, powerful month of year, transforming ourselves, the world around us. It should be a very uh, healthy week, Simcha Dika week. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. This has been My Life, Chassid is Applied. Thank you so much. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassid is Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapply.com slash donate.